Well, right there in the beginning of this story, with Jesus still dripping wet from his baptism, we're told that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Which might prompt us as we reach today's line in our Lord's Prayer study to notice that Jesus teaches us to pray regularly for God not to do something that God sometimes does anyway. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, don't do that, but deliver us from evil. Why would Jesus even put this line in there? It's a bit confusing, the line and that moment in Matthew we just heard, especially in light of what James writes in chapter 1, verse 13 of his letter. If you like to flip around in the Bible today, it's a good day to do it because I'm going to be doing that as well. In In James chapter 1, verse 13... He writes, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does God tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So, James writes, No one should say God is tempting me, for God doesn't do that sort of thing. And yet it seems Matthew is saying that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness for just that sort of thing. And then later, Jesus teaches us to pray daily for God not to do the very thing Matthew says the Spirit did to Jesus, and James says God doesn't ever do. Do you see the tension? Does God ever lead us into temptation? Is that what the prayer is implying? Well, despite what James said, Matthew makes it tempting to say God does. Which is nice, because the next time I polish off a whole bag of Oreos in one sitting, I can blame it on God. (laughs) I try not to keep things like that in the house. It's harder these days because I have growing young children and now their grandparents have moved in so there are Oreos and things like that but I I generally try to keep Oreos and Cool Ranch Doritos out of my reach because it's tempting for me if they're there at a certain point in the evening I get weak and then I will take them and eat them all of them at once (laughs) usually in the form of several many trips so I've lied to myself I've deceived myself I'll I'll take one trip and I'll get a few and then I'll go back and eat them and they're so good and they make me feel so good and clear-headed in the moment that I go back and I get some more and I keep doing that until there's nothing left and then I regret it Lay says you can only eat just one of their chips or you can eat just one which I find to be inaccurate Because the Lay's chips don't tempt me like the Oreos do, unless they're sour cream and cheddar Lay's, or but the regular ones don't tempt me unless I have bean dip. But anyway, put a package of Oreos in front of me and a glass of cool milk, and chances are at some point I will be tempted to eat one cookie and then another and then slowly 47. And you know, it's comforting to know that all of that happened, thus saith the Lord, because God led me by the power of the Spirit into that kitchen again and again and again until it was all gone. Except that that's not actually what seems to be happening here in Matthew 4. Jesus enters this time of the wilderness and the word that we translated temptation there is probably better translated a test what more than likely what we need to do here then with this and the lord's prayer is to make a distinction between tempting and temptation or the test or testing the idea is that evil tempts and god tests James actually makes this distinction in his letter just before he says God does not tempt. Back in James chapter 1, 
He says in verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So temptations, James says, is not something God does. That would be contrary to God's character and God's purposes. But testing, however, testing, that's another matter because it seems God does sometimes test to form God's character and God's purposes in us. There will be times, it seems, when God leads us into the wilderness of testing in our life with absolutely no promise of cookies or milk. There will be times, like in the Garden of Gethsemane, where we ask God to take this cup from us And we hope in that moment, like Jesus, we will be able to say with character and integrity and courage, not my will, but yours be done. None of us really likes to be tested, but Scripture says God can and does use tests to bring about God's purposes in us and through us. Which is not to say, by the way, and we we need to make a point of this, that Every or even the vast majority of difficult things that you go through in this world are a test from God. In fact, with my own limited knowing, I hesitate to point to any test or trial or or bit of suffering and say, well, God did that for, for God's purposes. And yet, Scripture says sometimes, maybe not all the time, but sometimes God does. We actually see an example of this in the Old Testament story that is both hyperlinked to the Lord's Prayer and embedded in the story of the wilderness testing of Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, we identified this connection between the request for God to give us this day our daily bread and the story of God providing manna or daily bread to the children of Israel in the wilderness. And then here in Matthew 4, when Jesus is being tempted by the devil to make bread out of stones, he quotes a passage from the Old Testament about what the wilderness wanderings were about from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Jesus says, It is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now, did you know... Did you know that in that passage, God giving Israelites manna in the wilderness was described by the author of Deuteronomy as a test? Described by the author of Deuteronomy as a test from God for the people. If you want to read along with me, you can. In Deuteronomy 8, chapter 1, Moses says, Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order... So that you would know what, so that God would know what was in your heart and whether or not you would keep His commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. Why? To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. It was a test. Scripture says, that God used for their formation. And I share this with you now to illustrate how Jesus himself might describe the purpose of a test from God for us, even as he teaches us to ask God daily not to lead us into one of those. Lead us not into the time of test. That's the first half of this sentence that we're looking at today. 
It raises some questions that we can't get to in this moment because the second half also raises its own set of questions. Lead us not into the testing, O God, but deliver us from the evil one. So what is going on there? Well, one thing you might pay attention to in your study of Matthew's Gospel is how Jesus so often presents as a new kind of Moses who is preparing to lead God's people, them and us, through a new kind of exodus. We've seen this already with the daily bread connection with manna in the wilderness. The connections continue here then with this request for deliverance. In the, in the original Exodus, see, the evil one was represented by the Pharaoh and the powers of Egypt. But in this new Exodus story, we know as the gospel, one greater than Moses who has come to lead us away from an even greater enemy, a power we've seen operating against us and against God since he first slithered into the Garden of Eden. One whose powers continue to be made manifest in seen and unseen ways, one Jesus identifies as the power and presence of evil. Jesus believed in the power and presence of evil. Lead us not into the time of test, but deliver us from the evil one. And that is actually how the prayer ends. Jesus believed in the power and presence of evil in this world. Do you believe in the power and presence of evil in this world? Do you believe there is evil in this world? Jesus did. In fact, doing battle with sin and evil was a major focus in his ministry. Jesus believed the forces of good, which are also the forces of God, are at work in the world in seen and unseen ways. And Jesus also believed that the forces of evil are at work in the world in seen and unseen ways. We believe in God's powerful, personal presence among us in this world, and Jesus believed that evil could be powerful and personal too. Jesus believed that evil can shape and influence and drive and take hold of real people in the midst of our lives through the forces of darkness and even through an evil and personal force of darkness, known in the Bible by many names including, but not limited to, the devil, the Satan, the enemy, the destroyer, the deceiver, the serpent, the evil one, just to name a few. Jesus believes evil is actual. In fact, in the early church, the most prominent belief about the meaning of the cross and the purpose of the cross was for Jesus to do battle and overthrow the powers of evil. Jesus believed in evil. And Jesus believed in the evil one. In fact, this is how Jesus described what he believed about the evil one. In John chapter 8, in an argument with religious leaders who uh, were arguing with Jesus about who their father is, Jesus said, If God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own, but God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you then? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. And this is how Jesus described the devil in this moment. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, a couple of observations about that. For Jesus, there is evil and there is an evil one. He believed that. And number two, Jesus describes the evil one as the father of lies, which is something we ought to pay attention to, really close attention to. Because Jesus 
you see, never describes the devil or a devil as one whose preferred choice of weaponry is a pitchfork. But rather, when Jesus talked about the evil one, he described him as one whose preferred choice of weaponry and attack was persuasion through deceptive and misleading words. So again, how does the devil bring about deception and death in this world? Through lies. For he is the source of lies and the master of deception. The world's leading expert on deception is Dr. Timothy Levine, who has spent years conducting hundreds of interviews with everyone from police officers to CIA agents. And his conclusion about human beings and deception is this. Levine says, even the most intelligent human beings are terrible at lie detection. Even the most intelligent of human beings, some of you may think you're the most intelligent of human beings. Dr. Levine says, even the most intelligent of human beings are terrible at lie detection, right off the bat. Through his research, he then developed this thing called the truth default theory, TDT, to explain how humans most often uh, default to truth. We assume someone is telling us the truth, then, unless there is sufficient evidence to the contrary. We assume someone is telling us the truth, often, unless there is sufficient evidence to the contrary. Journalist Malcolm Gladwell summarized TDT like this. We do not behave, in other words, usually like sober-minded scientists, slowly gathering evidence of truth or falsity of something before reaching our conclusions. No, instead, we usually do the opposite. We start by believing. And we stop believing only when our doubts and misgivings rise to the point where we can no longer explain them away. In other words, we are easily deceived. We are easily deceived. So how should we go about trying to detect the lies that may be all around us? What should we be looking for? How do masterful liars lie? Well, the most powerful lie, the most powerful liars, the most masterful liars can do it in such a way where it's incredibly difficult for most of us to discern the difference between a lie and the truth. And how do they accomplish that? They accomplish it by, well, the best lies are often at least a little bit, if not mostly, true. The best lies contain just enough truth to hook us into firmly, or at least mostly, believing what we've been told is true. Have you ever been tempted to believe that kind of a lie? Have you ever come to the place where you, you realize, you look back at something, you realize, well, I was, I was deceived, but man, that thing seemed really mostly true. Have you, have you ever been in a place where you realize you were being deceived by that kind of a lie? How often do we encounter those kinds of lies? I think we're surrounded by them. I think that we are in a day and age where perhaps more than ever before, they saturate our consciousness. Disinformation, for instance, or in the language of Scripture, deception seems to be at the root of almost every single problem we face in society and in our own souls. Gary Kasparov, the former world chess champion and Russian democracy advocate who is now in exile in Croatia, once offered this opinion about all of that. He said, The point of modern propaganda isn't only to spread misinformation or to push an agenda. It is to exhaust your critical thinking, to annihilate the truth. 
The point of modern propaganda isn't only to spread misinformation or to push a certain agenda, but to exhaust your critical thinking, to annihilate the truth. And so, with the social media algorithms and all kinds of propaganda saturating and shaping us, we've probably never in our lives needed to pray this prayer more. Oh God in heaven, please help us. Oh God in heaven, lead us not into the testing, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We've never needed to pray this more. I'd like to close this time today by now offering one more possibility about this line that might give us an insight into its meaning and even more how we might pray it. The, the punctuation marks, you know, are not in the original manuscripts. They're not a part of the original inspired texts of Scripture. They came and were added in later. And so it's possible that they were added in the wrong places. And with that being true, it's also possible that there might ought to be one more helpful comma in this part of the prayer that we could place after the words, lead us. Which would then create a different sense about what follows. Lead us. Pause. Lead us. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us. Not here, but there. Lead us not into this experience, but into that experience. Or simply and most importantly, God, lead us. Period. Wherever we go, whatever we, we're doing, whatever we're going through, lead us. Our Father in heaven, lead us. Lead us. Because you know we're so easily deceived. You know, God, we're so easily led astray. God, please don't let that happen. Please don't let that happen. Even when it comes from the best of intentions, give us the grace of providing us what you need and leading us exactly where you need for us to go. Make your leadership obvious. Lead us, O oh God. Lead us. And in this way, the 23rd Psalm actually captures so much of the sense of this line in the Lord's Prayer. And so with that in mind, I thought we might close this time together and move into our response by praying together the words of the 23rd Psalm. We've listed it in the King James because we know that some of you have committed this to memory in this way. Pray with me for God's leadership. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.